So without further ado, I would very much like to introduce our district attorney, David Sullivan. Good evening, everyone, and I want to thank uh, the Ward 3 Neighbor Association for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, I know many of you, and for those I haven't met, uh, hopefully I'll have a chance to uh, take questions from you or meet you by the end of the night. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Jerry, who's uh, the president of your association, and also uh, Owen, uh, your city councilor, uh, for the invitation to come here tonight. And part of uh, what we do as a district attorney's office is to try to convey to the public that we're here uh, not only just to prosecute cases, but also uh, to be proactive and to prevent crime and to work with communities. And since I started in office, we've initiated a community prosecution program where we really try to uh, pair prosecutors with the communities uh, that they live and work in. And uh, I'm very honored to have here tonight uh, you know, several of the prosecutors that are working on our cases and really working uh, for public safety uh, in Northampton and the other 46 communities. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, our Assistant District Attorney, uh, Matthew Thomas, uh, resident of Northampton. Uh, Matt has uh, uh, got 11 years plus of prosecution experience uh, in major felonies and uh, those are the type of cases that he handles in our office in the Superior Court. Uh, also here is our first assistant district attorney, uh, Steve Gagney, also uh, 10 years plus experience uh, working on uh, major uh, felonies, and uh, he's our uh, chief of our superior court in uh, all our major felonies. So uh, introduce uh, Steve Gagney. <laughs> also here is uh, our director of community outreach and education, uh, Jan McCor. And Yana coordinates uh, many different programs uh, from uh, all the education programs that are geared toward safe schools, uh, toward uh, helping uh, elders uh, with our triad program. She works with Chris Geffen uh, and with a number of other initiatives uh, that help uh, communities uh, gain the access uh, to information and assistance that they need. So Yana McCord. And the person who probably knows uh, more of the people in this room than anybody is uh, our Director of Communications, uh, Mary Carey. And uh, Mary came into our office, um, and one of the, the prime reasons is to be uh, accessible and of assistance uh, to the public and to the media and to make sure that uh, the information that you need about your community safety and about prosecutions uh, is out there and up front. So uh, I'm going to grab a little sheet here because I know some people already had sent some questions along. And, uh, but I also want to introduce, uh, Northampton has a very proactive uh, police department. Uh, they reach out into the community, they work with every neighborhood and every ward. And we have Captain Jody uh, Casper here tonight, uh, who's going to also <laughs> who's gonna be able to answer some questions. Uh, I know that there was uh, some a question that had come up about uh, uh, homelessness uh, in the uh, Ward 3 community, some of the things that uh, the uh, police department and community uh, may be addressing. So, uh, without further ado, I'd kind of like to just explain uh, what our community prosecution program is about. Um, really what it is, is listening and responding to uh, problems of crime in neighborhoods and communities. And it's really a problem-solving uh, situation that where the prosecutor's office works with the community, uh, with the police departments, uh, maybe with schools. And so, uh, when we... Uh, started our administration in early 2011, we really looked at what some of the issues were. For example, we're in a school here tonight, uh, Bridge Street School. One of the most critical problems in our schools was about bullying. And so we have established a safe school response team, uh, which is headed by uh, our Deputy District Attorney, Jan Healy, and uh, Rosemary Tarantino. And they are also the co-chairs of our civil rights uh, committee uh, that responds to civil rights violations. And I hope that conveys to everyone here the seriousness uh, for which we look at violence in our schools and about bullying in our communities. Many times it impinges on a student's civil rights uh, to a free and open uh, education. So uh, that's one example of community prosecution. The other is that we have specialized units 
uh, that work with elders. Our elder uh, and disabled persons unit works directly with elders and disabled uh, who may be victims of financial abuse, physical abuse, uh, so that they can respond to those crimes in a, in a timely way. Uh, another area of community prosecution is we work uh, strongly with uh, uh, domestic violence uh, prevention and response teams uh, every woman's center, Safe Passage, uh, Nelquit, up in Franklin County to, to build the resources and the commitment toward helping uh, victims of domestic violence. So that's just an example of how community prosecution hopefully can reach into your community and respond to whatever needs that you have uh, that are there. Um, so uh, let, me, uh, let me invite Matt to come up uh, and Jody and, and Steve uh, and Yana. Uh, all of you can come up and uh, we can field questions. Um, I know that uh, probably the first uh, question that I got was about the status of the Anthony Bay case. So I want to start with, uh, I've met with Mrs. Yeske, and again, I extend my deepest condolences uh, to Elaine Yeske and her family, and to you, the neighbors. Uh, I understand from a distance, I live in East Hampton, but I understand how a crime can impact an individual. But the impact on your neighborhood and community is something that many of us can't fathom. The series of fires that started in 2007 and then culminated on December 27, 2009, uh, really was acts that paralyzed and terrorized Ward 3. And, uh, but from the conversations I had with people, uh, both before I was elected and after I was elected, uh, certainly uh, it, it's something that I've taken seriously since I became district attorney and continue to take very seriously. Um, in that vein, uh, before I started as district attorney, I reached out to uh, Brett Vitero, um, uh, I would say probably the most experienced prosecutor who was prosecuted uh, over 200 arson fires, uh, over 80 homicides in his career as both a Hamden County District Attorney, but also as a special assistant district attorney um, in their arson uh, investigation prosecution unit. So we've taken it very seriously. He's, that's his duty. That's his main job in our office, uh, is just to make sure that this case move forward in a fair, deliberate, unfortunately not always in a speedy way. So I know that I came as a shock to Ward 3, uh, after uh, the interview and interrogation of Anthony Bay uh, was uh, suppressed by the Supreme Court, uh, we needed as an office to regroup and to make sure that uh, we prosecuted this case in a fair way. Uh, and as a result of that review, we made the decision, and I think in a correct way, uh, that we needed to reindict Mr. Bay uh, so that um, the process of indictment uh, was not influenced uh, by this uh, interrogation and, and the admissions that he made. So we brought it before another grand jury. As a result, he was reindicted on all the same charges that were there before. In addition, we had put together um, a prosecution case for 11 other fires that happened in 2007 into 2008 that preceded the 2009 fires. So at the present time, um, in your pamphlet, we, we listed all the fires for which Mr. Bay was indicted with the dates and with the addresses. And I want to say right now that if there are any residents of those homes or of those addresses that uh, have not been in contact or we haven't been in contact with, with you, um, please see Yana McClure tonight and uh, we're going to put you directly in contact with our, our victim witness uh, advocate unit. Uh, we uh, have done our best to try to reach out to everyone who is uh, a victim of those 11 fires that happened during 2007, 2008. So my apologies if our office hasn't been in direct contact with you, but we want to reach out to you uh, tonight. Uh, 
the present status of the case is that on Thursday there'll be a status hearing. And a status hearing uh, basically means that the defense and the prosecution will meet with the Superior Court judge assigned to this case, which is Constance Sweeney. Judge Sweeney has uh, personal jurisdiction over this case. Uh, she's going to be following it from the beginning to the end. And at that point, uh, she'll establish a timeline for any pretrial motions, um, any uh, type of preliminary hearings, and sometimes, but I don't expect, uh, a trial date will be set. I expect that to be set a little further down the road. So uh, because there are 11 new criminal offenses, or I should say uh, 11 different uh, fires that uh, occurred, the defense uh, is still reviewing uh, the discovery that we've produced, and if we have any further uh, documents or reports, we're going to produce that to the defense, as is our duty. So, uh, so that uh, is one of the things that I think is important that, uh, that we have an obligation, not just to fight for the, and protect the rights of victims, but we also have the obligation to make sure the rights of the defendant, uh, in this case, are uh, protected. So, so that is the, the status at the present time of the, the Bay case, uh, the price, and you'll see things in the news, uh, the Gazette and Republican, both uh, media outlets have done a tremendous job reporting on the fires and the prosecution of this case, and Mary, our director of communications, tries to send out uh, when dates are going to happen so that they get in the media so that you, um, as a citizen, have the opportunity to, to come to these hearings if you want. Uh, there was a change of venue, and that was filed by the defense, uh, to say that Hampshire County uh, would not be uh, a place where a fair um, jury could be uh, assembled. Uh, we didn't necessarily agree with that, but erring on the side of caution, we assented to that hearing uh, with a provision that the case will be heard in Hampshire County Superior Court. So all hearings, all trials are open to the public. You're welcome. Anybody is welcome. Uh, the jury pool, when it comes to the trial, will be drawn from Hamden County, uh, where uh, we feel that it will be a, a jury uh, where Mr. Bay and the Commonwealth can have a fair trial. So that's the status of uh, you as an individual have that right to attend any hearings, and that included the motion to suppress and other hearings as well. Um, so that's kind of the preliminary status theory. So, um, so I, I kind of want to maybe take some questions right now, um, if people have them uh, about the Bay case, about the status, or uh, does anybody have any particular questions? Uh, Fred, I know you can't give. Particulars, but can you just say in general terms how confident you are in your case? Very confident. Well, I think we have a wonderful police department, and I like all of my neighbors that are so pleased that they found somebody they thought fit the fire so quickly. I was dismayed that the initial interrogation report got thrown up by the FBC. What do you think? What do you think happened? Well, well, not be able to say. well, the, the uh, interrogation was shown in public at, at the hearing. Uh, we felt very strongly that uh, it was a voluntary statement. It wasn't against his free will. Um, and the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts disagreed. Uh, they ruled that we could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the standard. We could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the statement was voluntary. And, and based upon that, they, su they supported uh, the suppression of that uh, statement. So we we move on. We take all the evidence that we have, and we're confident that we're going to have a conviction in this case. Okay. Why, at the original indictment of Mr. Bay, were the eleven new arson crimes not included? Why are they just being included now and not original? Uh, I can't speak to what the prior administration had uh, developed about the case. When I came in and our prosecution team assembled with the Northampton Police, the Massachusetts State Police, uh, we started a new, we, we took a whole fresh uh, look 
with our prosecutor, with everybody, and we really worked on um, trying to determine to the best of our ability who committed those prior offenses. We knew that that was um, an issue um, that had to be resolved to the best of our ability. And when we put our case together and we reviewed all the facts, uh, the individual that it pointed to that it was consistent with uh, the crimes that happened on December 27th and that the evidence shows or will show uh, was guilty for those uh, 11 offenses was Anthony Bay. I can't underscore the cooperation that we've had with our law enforcement, with the Mass State Police, with the Northampton Police Department, with the State Fire Marshals, and it was really through uh, the expertise of law enforcement and other individuals that we were able to put the case together uh, to present to the grand jury, and the grand jury uh, agreed with our analysis and uh, you know, brought that bill of indictment uh, for the other 11 fires that happened in 2007. And a follow-up question, are you confident, that's a poor choice of words, um, are there, is there any other uh, possible indi individual or individuals that may have been involved either on uh, Holocaust or in those other 11 fires? It is our belief that he acted solely in individual. We have no evidence to point to any other individuals uh, that may have been involved in any of the fires. So that, that's our uh, case is that he acted as an individual. We have no evidence at this point uh, pointing to any other individual. Uh, but I will say, just to dovetail, that um, within your pamphlets is our text to tip. Uh, and we put that out you know, after we dismissed the indictment. Uh, and we, uh, again, urge that you know, when you look at these addresses, you look at the dates, and you know, who knows when you you or your neighbors or your uh, loved ones uh, try to help recollect if you have a memory, certainly uh, of something that may be important, then that text-to-tip is there. And uh, you can use that text-to-tip or call directly to the Northampton Police Department, the detectives unit, uh, for the arson hotline, and uh, we can take that. So uh, as much as we have a case, we always want to make it stronger. Is there any... Um, discussion within the trial um, uh, preparation or in the trial, will there be any discussion about why he did this? The psychology, I mean, what, what he thought about, I mean, I know that that's always a question, it's like, um, he went to school with my kid, so uh, it's like, what happened? Is there going to be anything for that? Anthony Bay has the constitutional right to remain silent. And the motives for this, um, we can't determine. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's in his mind uh, why he committed these crimes. So, so he hasn't addressed, I mean, I don't know if you can say this, but he hasn't addressed that, or I'm, I haven't seen anything in the paper about During the course of the interrogations, uh, Matt uh, Thomas could address it. I, I don't believe during the course of his interviews that be revealed. Right, I mean, part of the Commonwealth's proof is we don't have to prove motive. Um, it's, it's not an aspect, like, thank you. It's not an aspect of the case that we have to show. Uh, it, 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 it would make sense, everyone is looking for that sense of it, because facially it seems like such a senseless thing to do. Um, presently, we don't have um, the, the kind of driving force that. Uh, that one would expect to see with a crime like this. So, so all you have to show is means and opportunity? Well, there's a number of things we have to show. I mean, each crime that he's indicted with, and, and there, as you can see from what we've handed out, there's a great many of them. Each one of those crimes has elements that we would have to show. Um, but we would need to show, in, in essence, that he's the, the actor and had the intent uh, to commit the indicted crimes. But intent to do it and the underlying psychological impetus for doing it are two different things. How can you show intent without the motive? Oh, well, he just mean he just needs to mean it, uh, just that it's not accidental behavior. Uh -huh. uh, and that, just to let you know that Assistant District Attorney Thomas will be co-counsel with Fred Vitero. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So we have co-counsel and also uh, the chief of our appellate division, uh, Tom Townsend, will be. Uh, and has been assisting with the 
case. So uh, our chief of our appellate bureau, Mr. Vitero, and Mr. Thomas will be the, the co trial counsel in this case. So. Okay. Yes, Wendy. Uh, one is, as you described, um, and in particular, arson is a very difficult uh, case to investigate and to solve, uh, just because of the nature of it, particularly um, you know, uh, with very late at night, and no ability necessarily to, to pin something on a particular individual at a certain time. But what I think is really important is what we're doing here tonight. You know, when there is a crime cycle and there is an epidemic of uh, particular cases, and I think that Northampton has a great database now, and I think that our office is always available uh, to law enforcement that uh, when there is trends in crime, that police departments, uh, particularly Northampton, are better equipped now uh, to see those trends. Our office is proactive. Um, we're available 24-7 to respond to any crimes, and uh, I think in this case that um, a task force, if, if the rash of uh, 
arsons in 2007 had, that pattern had been uh, developed or recognized at that point, uh, I would have gladly been part of any type of arson task force and, and had uh, one or more of our prosecutors involved in that. So I think there's an openness uh, in communication and I think um, a lot of it's listening to neighborhood concerns. The folks in Ward 3 were really the canaries. You recognized, you know, that there was a crisis. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, the, all the puzzle pieces hadn't been put together. And that's the sad part of the December 27, 2009 fires is that, uh, obviously, at that point in time, um, the arsonist had not been identified and, was not apprehended to prevent those. But I think in the future, and, and Jody uh, can elaborate a little bit more about what their community initiatives are, uh, I can't tell you uh, how important it is for me that any time I left the phone to the chief, to a detective in Northampton or any other community, um, they really are helpful and hopefully that same relationship uh, exists with our office, uh, with who our seasoned prosecutors and also uh, our staff that works on our cases, but let me let me give it over to uh, uh, Captain Casper. I'll just leave it over there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. That's why she's a captain. Well, to be honest, I'm actually not a captain. Although I don't I want to be right a captain. Here, but, but, <laughs> well, she should be a captain. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, there, there is a, a good, clear answer to that, and that's that I think in my experience, I've been with the police department for about 15 years now, and what I've seen is a huge change in technology, and I think one of the things that you'll see come out in this case over time is just how important technology was to it. Um, some of the things that I can tell you specifically are that, for instance, all of our cruisers have cameras in them now that are running all the time. So, for instance, anywhere we drive, it's always recording. So if a car passes us, you know, that, that's recorded. Um, many of the convenience stores and other stores downtown have surveillance imaging. So we use a, a lot more technology than we did today. And one of our detectives, Corey Robinson, since back then, when you referred to those early fires back in 2007 and 2008, uh, we simply we didn't have anyone that was trained in video forensics, and we do now. Uh, so that's we have a whole office dedicated to it in our beautiful new building, and thank you for that. Um, and we are better able to look at video footage and extract evidence from it. Um, as the DA said, it's incredibly complicated and challenging to solve an arson case. I mean, if you just think about it, you've got basically a, a, a smoldering fire uh, left in places and not much else. So it really bears the burden falls on technology that we use. And the second thing that we have is you all. Our attention as a community has certainly been heightened to arson, and people have been much more able to give us good information from the street. I think people are good about being able to see things that are out of the ordinary and give us a call. And we are always willing to go out and go to anything that anyone calls us on. If you see something suspicious, and I think we've made that clear, I mean, I don't even need to say it, but you know, if you do, you can certainly call us, and we will send someone. We always send someone. And when we do that, who knows what we'll find. But just going out and identifying someone, getting that information, and that's all documented. You know, we know if we've had an encounter with any of you on the street, you may not want us to know this, but we, we know. We know when we've dealt with you. So if we see a pattern of dealing with the same person out at a certain time, that's the kind of technology that we have at our fingertips now. So that's what makes us better able to to deal with these sorts of crimes. And honestly, patterns are always more clear when you're beyond them. You know, when you're in the midst of them, it's not always clear that it's, it's a pattern. Of course, now looking back, you know, we're able to see it much more clearly. But we've definitely made a lot of changes that have helped us solve a lot of different types of crimes, not just arson. Um, can I ask you a question? Sure. And this goes back to the actual meetings that we had. We had three meetings, 2007, 8, and 9 with the police chief, fire chief, and mayor. And there was one thing that surprised me, and I guess maybe it shouldn't have, but from those meetings what I gathered was that the person responsible for investigating an arson fire is the police department, not the fire department? It's a combined effort of multiple agencies. We have a fire investigator, the, the fire department has someone, the fire marshal's office as well. So it's a combined effort of many. 
And the second thing about those meetings were that at those three meetings, almost all the time, someone stood up and said, gee, well, what are you doing about trying to find this guy? And the answer invariably was, well, we can't tell you because we're going to give away, blah, 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 whatever, which is a sensible answer. Mm -hmm. However, one thing that surprised me was that no one, the fire chief or the police chief or the mayor, didn't say, well, but you know, we've logged 300 overtime hours last month, 200 this month, we've spent X dollars. There was no accounting for what type of investigation was going on. Mm -hmm. I think we would have all felt more comfortable if they said, you know, we're putting in 40 overtime hours a week or 100 or whatever or some sort of just accounting of what's going on as opposed to we can't tell you because we'll give it away to the arson. So I don't know what you want to do in the future, but it might be worthwhile. And I don't know how your bookkeeping is done in the police department, whether you have to charge your time to specific tasks or you just put in 40 hours a week and that's it. So. I don't know how you handled that, but it would have been nice and convenient at that time if we had some sort of assurance that this amount of work was being done. That makes sense, and I'll certainly I'll keep it in mind in the future and pass it on to my chief and captains as well. I mean, I can say that there are things that we do that we simply can't share because it's not just you and I in this room, and that, you know, that's fun. That's and, fun. and that is what it comes down to. If we have people squirreled away watching things, we we can't share that. But I'll keep it in mind in the future. It's a reasonable request, certainly. Can you address more generally just, um, you know, what if it doesn't come to downtown? And I know people are, I've heard that part of our agenda was to talk about the incident that happened recently. Um, but not that specifically, but just in general, where are we in the community policing and the downtown presence? And, you know, we have pockets of places where people are in the woods. And, you know, just what is there and what, you know, what are your suggestions? I hear that you're saying you're. Um, and the courts receptive to that feedback, but I used it online and stuff. I don't know. Like, I don't know if I should continue to complain that people are leaving needles and bottles and things in the same place, or if I just need to understand that in the fiscal constraints that you find yourself, that nobody's going up there or out there to find out. You absolutely should call, and, and you can fill out things online, honestly. I mean, you can call me directly. I, I work 3 to 11. I'm the 3 to 11 shift commander, and I will send officers there. I send officers to do things all the time. They want to be there and to find these things and respond to your needs, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, multiple resources available. You know, we have two officers that are typically downtown on, on bike patrol during the summertime and during the good weather, and typically one or two on foot in the wintertime. Um, and those officers are sometimes used to do these more directed patrols. So if there was an area where there was a lot of needles or, you know, other evidence of criminal activity, you just have to, you can email us and let us know. And I, I tell you that that does go out at shift change. We talk about it and officers will go there and will check it. And if you looked at our log, you know, if you called in a specific complaint about whatever street it may be, you would look at our log shortly after that and see that appearing as a check for that location. And I mean, I can't guarantee it would happen the next day because if something big happens, we, we would have to prioritize our calls. It is true that we only have a certain number of people on the street at night and, and you know, all the time, and, and we have to pay attention to our calls for service, but we do go out and try to uh, respond to any needs that you have. So I encourage you to do that. And like, my last name is Casper, and you can call me directly, and I'm happy to talk with you. And, identify those problems and respond to them. Okay. Yep. Uh, I appreciate hearing about the technology that's being used. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of that to be able to get about the procedures uh, that may, uh, you may have learned from, uh, from the night of uh, the 27th through the interrogation process that may change? If you want police procedures, that's me. If you want Supreme Judicial Court, what, what would you well, like to address? Sure <laughs> you know, as far as the, you know, the state police uh, interviewing him on the street that night and, and a local police uh, and the interrogation itself, uh, how it's thrown out. Uh, have you learned any different procedures that would have allowed us to keep that confession or uh, pursue him that night a little bit? The interrogation that was uh, thrown out didn't involve the Northampton Police. It was the arson investigation in, 
investigators for the Mass State Police. When this uh, opinion came out for the Supreme Judicial Court, we made sure that the colonel of the Mass State Police uh, not only got a copy of the, uh, the decision, but also of the tape. So uh, every defense and prosecutor in Massachusetts uh, needs to review this case. We need to make sure that our interrogations comply with the Constitution. And uh, I foresee, and it's already scheduled throughout Massachusetts, uh, workshops on interrogation and, uh, and confessions, because we want to make sure that uh, when they are conducted, they're done constitutionally, and uh, that they're admitted when they uh, meet that standard. Yes? Actually, I have uh, two questions. I've lived on Dr. Hanson pretty much my whole life, but I've worked a lot of the but I just want to let you know, I lived on Marshall Street when I was a kid and then on Graves Ave. So I only got about four years in Wood, wood 3. So you got you got a leg up on it. So. I, I do. I've lived a few years on so, so I actually remember growing up and all through the years, I've mean, been quite a few major fires and a lot of minor fires in the downtown area. So my first question is, Number of fires and arson cases in Northampton, usually the typical for a town this size and the density of downtown, or are we higher or lower? Is it just available? Um, I remember the Lumber Yard fire and the condos on uh, Randolph Place and the uh, Whistle Stop restaurant, and uh, there were a couple other pretty big ones downtown. I had Whistle something. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there's been a lot of fires in Northampton. Um, so, my first question is whether it's typical or how it's size. And my second question is, are there open investigations that you're able to talk about remaining the period from, you know, all these fires, 2005, 6, 7, to the, to the current that are still being investigated? Or is everything pretty much closed now? Or uh, where are we stand on that? Well, it, if it was determined to be of suspicious nature, uh, those are always open. Uh, so uh, it, as far as ongoing or how active they are, I can't make a comment on them. Uh, I will say that, you know, there are, obviously there are fire statistics. 2007 and 2009 were spiked. Uh, they were obviously spiked by what we believe were, were fires set by Anthony Bay. So, uh, and there very rarely in the history of Massachusetts did you see such um, uh, a horrific group of fires within uh, a short period of time, about an hour and a half, that, that happened in Northampton on December 27th. So um, going back to the program that we started, No Fires, um, uh, there's always been um, a lot of fires that are accidentally or intentionally set by juveniles. And uh, that's one of the things that, that we're working on in our district, we've estimated anywhere from uh, 45 to 75 cases a year of arson are by kids, you know, that uh, are maybe experimenting or uh, have some type of stressor in their life. So, um, so not all of them are set by adults. And, and uh, you know, when the fire department goes, they, they investigate that. And I can't say enough about the collaboration between the fire department, the police departments, and the fire marshal's office. They work hand in hand. You know, as soon as they feel that it's something of a suspicious nature, that uh, arson uh, investigation team arrives and um, they treat it just like a crime scene. So uh, on the night of the December 27th, every single one of those fires was treated as a crime scene. And because of that, we were able to you know, build the, the forensic case uh, that, that went on in this case. So, uh, but you know, there's fires that happen in communities. What the real weight is, I think that would be up to some type of statistician with the uh, fire insurance companies. Yes? Um, this isn't about the fires, this is more um, in relationship to a different question. Is it possible to see a log of the accumulative calls that citizens make about things that happen in the neighborhood? Um, for instance, I know that right where the railroad bridge is, um, up above behind the condos, that there, I was told, over 146 calls made since January about things happening up there. I mean, is it possible for Word 3 to get information about 
where are the hot spots and how many calls have been made by our neighbors about things that have concerned us and that you all have responded to and, and you know, if drugs were involved, if, um, I mean, maybe something didn't go to court, you know, maybe somebody did something, by the time the police got there, it wasn't there. But just, you know, I've got a concern about things like that. Sure. Have you been on our website? No, but I have 911 my cell phone when I'm walking at night. Okay. Um, if you go onto our website, you'll see a link on the main page that says daily logs. And if okay. you go into that daily log section, you can look by month and year. I'm not sure how far back it goes. Uh, we started this maybe a year and a half or two ago, so I'm not sure how far, far back it goes. But you can click on a month and you can scroll through the log of all the calls that we've been to. Uh, and you'll get a brief overview of the nature of the call, which would typically be up there, suspicious person, which is just kind of a general term for someone's up there and I want you to check them out. And then what the outcome was as far as if there's a report that ends in AR, you know, it's an arrest and you see what happened up there. And we know what goes on up there, I will say. We're familiar with the fact that we have a lot of drinking that goes on up there. And our bike patrol is very aware of that, and they're up there multiple times at night, uh, checking the railroad track area and the naval walkway. That's a very frequent area that we check and, and frankly, continue to find problems. We didn't hear the question that here, so what about up there? Up on the naval walkway. The question was, well, the question was whether or not there was a log of our activities. So she would know what her neighbors were calling in and then what our response was. So I recommended she go to our website, and she's specifically she was talking about the Nega Walkway as well as somewhere that she is sometimes, and you call 911 yeah, I, from under up there. the bridge is where I call. Um, oh, under the bridge as well, yeah. yeah. Because there are accumulated people, and if somebody's very much out of control, I'll call. Just because I was told that um, people don't call, and the, the things that get done, the police, when they look at their records, you know, if somebody says, oh, you know, I saw, unless you, you actually register and call and say I'm worried about this, the things aren't, people don't pay attention to it. And so I, I mean, I just wonder about different parts. I know Ward 3 has, you know, a large community of people drifting in and out. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've certainly noticed not familiar faces quite often in the last year. And I'm just concerned about the general gist of this. And I don't know if this is a Ward 3 issue in itself. <laughs> so what is your specific question? My specific I, question is, is that's on the line, is it if there are any findings that you all have come to about our district that you should be aware of, um, what would this be? We know where the problem areas are, as do you as well. And, and I mean, there are areas where people duck off to, off the main street, to engage in a variety of behavior. And we know that, we know what it is, and we fr frequently check it. Do I think that this behavior is anything that is threatening to you? You know, not particularly. Uh, we're talking mostly about drug and alcohol use. I mean, not that there are residual effects, but I mean, in general, I, I don't feel that this is an area where we have had major violent crimes happen or anything like this. Um, we have people who duck away to, to drink and do drugs. and. We make arrests when it's appropriate, and we're very busy up there. And under the bridge as well. Just at 6 o'clock tonight, we had a call under the bridge and made an arrest. I mean, and that was a result of someone calling. Someone called concerned because there was a gentleman under there, and that's typically the call we get for under the bridge. And we go, and if we find them with an open container of alcohol, and it's someone that we've dealt with before, and we'll, we'll make an arrest on that. And, and also, I mean, I knew that there was a homeless, you know, that there are different places, maybe somebody in the dress that said, you know, that homeless live, or they're different camps, and that they change. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I go for walks along the dike, and I see people, you know, to different mm -hmm. places, um, is there concern for us about things? Like, you know, have they gotten larger? I guess is what I'm asking. No, about the camps they have there. not gotten larger. And if, to, to address two things regarding camps that are set up by by people who are homeless. Um, the, there used to be a few years ago some larger camp areas and what happened is it became obvious that they were there and then it attracted a lot of attention, we had a lot of trouble down there and now people are like, I don't want to be around a lot of other people. So members of our homeless population, many people sleep in different areas and honestly we know where they are. These are people that we deal with every day, you know, every other day, weekly, whatever it may be. We know them and we know where they stay. 
so as far as having large camps set up, to my knowledge, that's not going on anymore. And, and I do, I've, I've been down in the other ones where they used to be, and we haven't had any problems like that. And your second concern as far as being afraid walking up on the dike, I mean, be as afraid there as you would be anywhere else. It's okay. just, I, I'm not afraid. I walk up there, and it's a beautiful spot to walk, and I enjoy it. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> yeah, other than having to watch where you step. That's about right. it. <laughs> yes, it's very nice up there. I have, I have no concerns about that. What was the department's what on drug dealing? Uh, in the public policy. Yep. And in the Pleasant Park. Because I know there's a lot of dealing in the public policy. And they say, well, see if you can us, but they don't believe what we can do. It is a common public perception that we're not doing anything. Uh, however, it's an extremely complicated process to identify drug dealers. I mean, we can't just. If someone says, I see hand-to-hand -hand deals in a neighborhood and I want you guys to do something, what we, what we do with that information is we collect background information on it and pass it on to our detective who specializes in drug investigations. It can take months before anything happens with that case. We, there's a number of things that we have to do. I wish we could go and knock on the door and be like, we're taking all your drugs and arresting you. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, and there will be a problem until this country doesn't have a drug problem. Right. I do hear you. I can assure you that we do investigate these cases. We, we do undercover buys, as you've seen in the paper, and we prosecute these cases along with the district attorney's office. It just, there's so much that you have to do in order to go in and make an arrest and, and do a search warrant and, you know, knock down a door and arrest everyone inside. Those cases just take six, six months to a year. I mean, it, it takes a long time to make that happen. But we don't ignore those at all. We give them to our investigators and they, they set those cases up. It's not anything that we handle particularly, you know, on, on the front line as far as our patrol officers. It's handled within the detective bureau. Yes? Um, a chronic hot spot is usually Northampton how a lodging on, on Pleasant Street. And I know that the city has made efforts over the years to acquire and fix over SROs and um, basically upgrade them. But essentially, the, this always seems to have been bypassed in Northampton Lodging, which has some of the worst living conditions inside, especially in the cellar, and also in terms of screening. Do you have any comment? It seems like something should be done to work with the owner. We do work hand in hand with the manager uh, that's on site there. That is a business that, or a, sorry, a residence that we go to frequently. Uh, we work with him. We, we all know him very well. And when he has problem tenants, tenants that are you know, having us respond a lot or we're arresting them, we work with him. And if he chooses to evict them, he chooses to evict them. I can't do more than that. Okay, do you have any idea how many suspicious fires they've been that have been in the Ward 3 neighborhood since like January 2010 when Mr. Gay in custody? Absolutely not. No, I said absolutely not. I don't have any idea. <laughs> I don't have that number. My apologies. Do you have a question? You said. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Superior Court question. Uh, basically what happened is I lived in Ward 3, so I lived through all the fires, and naturally I was concerned about the outcome. Uh, so when I learned that Anthony Bay was going to be in Superior Court at 2 o'clock on a certain day, I marked the calendar, went down there, he was in court, uh, the defense attorney asked for more information, they made arrangements to do that, and they set another date for, I guess, was it a hearing? So, marked the calendar again, went down, 2 o'clock, on that day, got there, sitting, sitting, sitting. The guard came up and said, well, it's all been postponed. And he told me that it's been postponed to a certain date. I went to the next schedule, of, next, next, 
next scheduled day, and they did have a hearing. Again, it was a minor issue, and they scheduled another hearing at another day. Went down the fourth time, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, sat down, waited, waited, waited. Again, it was postponed. So I was a bit disappointed, and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the Superior Court office, which I think is down the hall, and I asked the administrator down there, well, what do I do? I mean, I wanted to go. I didn't find out it was postponed. How do you learn these things? Can I be informed about when it happens? And I was told that you could be informed if you were involved with the case or one of the immediate people in the case, but otherwise you couldn't. So my question is, how do you find out when these things happen and when they're postponed? <laughs> I find out later than most people. Uh, uh, when there's a continuance, especially on a major case like this, we try to get that right out to the media. And um, for unforeseen reasons, the case can be continued. But I apologize because you're a member of the public that went to see these cases. And uh, all I can say is that I wish Fred Contrato would do a better job getting that. <laughs> but I mean, isn't, 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 there, isn't there a website for Superior Court that lists the schedule and that you could look to and see it's postponed or not? Is, I mean, these, these, uh, these are supposed to be public and the public should know about it. It shouldn't be, I mean, it sounds like it's almost secret. I didn't know that there was going to be an inquest. When did that happen? I don't know. You can't find out. It's difficult because, you know, some of that uh, court information is conducted at the last minute. But uh, we'll, we'll try to keep, uh, you know, reaching out and, uh, you know, let the media know when there's a, a new date and so that you Fred aren't inconvenienced or anybody else in the public because we don't want to create disinterest because and it's hard parking down there. You go down there, you got to get there early to find a parking space. Throw money in the meter, you lost a buck and a half in a meter. I complain a lot. Sorry. <laughs> the court system can be very frustrating and intimidating, and particularly for victims of crime. Uh, you know, again, we want to make sure that we reached out to every victim uh, of. Crime in, in the Bay case, and hopefully, if there's anybody here, you'll talk to uh, Yana. Okay, let's say, for example, there's one scheduled next month on a Thursday. Before I go, the day before I call, before I go, can I call your office and find out when they're supposed to Call the clerk's office because they'll actually they'll have real time information because if by chance the judge canceled out the last minute, so I just call directly to the Superior Court. So yeah, I asked for uh, Harry Jackanowski, who's oh. a member of the Polish Genealogical Society. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, and I know I, I'm getting a signal from uh, from Jerry. He's got a, a, a ward meeting to run, but I want to thank. Uh, everybody for um, having us here tonight and hopefully we've answered uh, uh, some of the questions and concerns you've had and uh, we'll do our best to, to be a good partner with the 3 and with the North Hampton community. So thanks again.